Okay, good afternoon, everyone. It's afternoon for me here in North Carolina. I realize that um, joining us for the panel today and with my co-editors, people are from all over the globe, but welcome and good afternoon. Welcome to the second of our webinar series for our book, um, the IGI publication, Developments in Virtual Learning Environments and the Global Workplace. This is the second of four webinars exploring all of the different ideas that our contributors gave to the book. Everyone knows that um, when the world shut down from the pandemic, virtual learning environments took off and many people didn't know what they were doing with them. However, the, my co-editors, um, Bill and Barbosa, Stephanie Swartz and Izzy Crawford and I had all been doing virtual learning environments. So we decided well, the book wasn't as a result of COVID, but we also, when we decided we were doing the book and COVID came around, we decided we were gonna reach out and see who else was doing some really great things in virtual learning environments. And we got great chapters, absolutely fab fabulous chapters great ideas, and we decided we would go ahead and do a series of webinars so that we could share these ideas with people. So I'm Susan Luck. As I said, um, I would like to introduce my, um, or let my co-editors uh, introduce themselves. We'll go in alphabetical order. Bella, can Hello, you introduce Lewis. yourself? <laughs> Hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Belem. I'm from Portugal, University of Porto, and I had the pleasure for the past few years to work with Susan, Stephanie, and Nisi in international uh, collaboration in COIL activities. Okay. Izzy, you're next. Hi, I'm Izzy Crawford, and I'm an academic strategic lead at Robert Gordon University in Aberdeen, Scotland. Okay. And and Stephanie. I'm Stephanie Swartz, and I am teaching business communication at the German University near Frankfurt. And um, I guess uh, Susan and I became partners in crime from the very okay. beginning. And uh, yeah, and um, we joined up with Izzy and Bellum. And after doing a couple virtual team projects together, we decided, hey, let's uh, find out what the others are doing out there as well. And we came up with the idea of the book, so. Well, this particular uh, webinar is uh, focusing on the second section of the book, which is called Virtual Learning Environments and Practice. And we have our contributors with us today, and I'm gonna have them introduce themselves in the order in which their chapters appear. So Arshana, you're first. You're the first one in that section. Yeah, so uh, thank you, uh, Susan. Um, I'll just briefly introduce myself. So I'm uh, Arshana Shivastav and I'm uh, teaching business communication at Birla Institute of Management Technology in India. And uh, I have been into teaching, training and researching. At present, my uh, biggest passion is researching. My major research contribution is in human communication. And uh, I do a lot of uh, uh, virtual uh, you know, collaborations and uh, my, I make my students participate into virtual activities. Um, so that is how it is. Um, and um, I'm so thankful uh, to Stephanie who uh, invited me to contribute a chapter in this book. And I'm grateful to everybody for inviting me today for a talk, for a panel talk. Thank sure. you. Well, thank you. We're glad to have you. Anuli, you're next. Thank you, Susan. So hi, everyone. My name is Anuli Ndubisi. I am the Research and Program Manager for the International Virtual Engineering Student Teams Project at University of Toronto. Um, I'm also an engineering instructor there in the Faculty of Applied Science and Engineering, where I teach global teamwork and project management concepts. Um, I'm also a researcher at the Encore Lab at Ontario Institute for Studies in Education, where I'm also conducting my doctoral studies. I have over 10 years professional experience working in global engineering project teams in the energy industry. And I'm passionate about preparing students for employment in, in the global economy. And I'm happy to be here. Thank you, Susan. Okay, well, we're glad to have you. Emil, we know you're traveling, but we're grateful you're with us. Can um, you introduce yourself? <laughs> Thank you. So my name is Emil Valinov. I'm uh, from Skoda Auto University, based here in Prague, in the Czech Republic. I'm working for the Department of Marketing and Management 
Uh, actually, I've been involved in uh, virtual experiential learning since 2017, where I've been uh, cooperating on the Blending Learning International Cooperation with my uh, dear friend and colleague, uh, Professor Jürgen Bleicher from uh, Duara Hochschule from Germany. Uh, actually, also, I'm uh, acting as adjunct associate professor at Riceva University of Applied Science in Riga. And uh, my uh, um, areas of expertise are international business and international management. Yeah, thank you. Well, thank you. That's great. That's great. And Sandra. <laughs> Hi, so Sandra Vasconcelos. I'm an English professor uh, in Portugal. I work at two different schools. So one is the Agro Superior School of Technology and Management. And I also work in the School of Hospitality um, and Tourism in Porto. And I teach English. I have a PhD in multimedia and education, and um, I'm very much in touch with uh, technology and um, learning, not only in terms of research, but also in everyday life. So it's something that uh, I use in my classes. Uh, my colleague, Annabelle, is also here. We're kind of known for using lots of different strategies <laughs> in class. And thank you for the invitation. <laughs> Well, you're welcome. So let's get down to what all is the wonderful information that's in this book, in this chapter. So Arshana, let's start with you. Tell us about your chapter. Tell us what it covers as an overview, and then I've got, we've got a few questions for you. Sure. So uh, basically, um, though I have been doing many activities, but this chapter confines on two uh, of the activities that I have done in past. And uh, to begin with, the first one was the one when we started in uh, 2016. So this was before COVID, when uh, not many such kind of activities were in place. So I have been teaching in the uh, in uh, management uh, school for so many years, and uh, we have uh, one full uh, you know course in international business. And when we teach business communication in international business, our major focus or the learning goal of the course is uh, to build the global mindset in students. Now with this basic objective, we've been taking classes and then when we talk about cultural sensitivity, uh, we normally used to focus upon uh, Hofstede and Tompanas and various other theories. And uh, basically it was in a lecture mode, uh, but and then there were some students who used to opt to go for, you know, exchange, they pick up exchange programs and they used to go to the partner universities to learn the cultural sensitivity and cross-cultural communication. But there were many students who uh, could not go to such kind of exchange programs and they were not exposed to, you know, uh, the cultural differences and they never used to get opportunities to interact with uh, with the people uh, outside uh, India. So uh, we have been thinking for some time in our departments, I'm also heading the department and we've done various uh, meetings regarding this, that how we can expose the rest of the students who cannot afford to have the global exposure uh, into you know something wherein they get to interact and work with the people from outside and learn. Because basically what we feel is experience is the best teacher. Uh, so, um, uh, I, along with, you know, two more professors uh, from the partner university, uh, one from Austria and another one from Russia. So, we collaborated and uh, we thought that we are going to give them a virtual experience. At that time, it was not very common or popular uh, to have such kind of a project. So, when we decided that we are going to collaborate and come up with some uh, classroom exercise or an activity, uh, we were not knowing what uh, we'll have to do. So we together sat and we uh, designed this entire activity. So initially it was uh, I along with the professor from Austria, not Russia. And in 2016, we began this exercise uh, by designing uh, an exercise which is based on uh, the theory of connectivity, uh, which is given by Seaman. And uh, uh, this entire theory is based on a principle that says that uh, knowledge is uh, not static. It keeps on changing. It's highly dynamic. So something which is today appears to be correct may be uh, incorrect tomorrow because things are changing very fast. And uh, that is why 
uh, the theory uh, emphasizes upon not giving a rote, uh, you know, lectures in the classroom, rather putting the students uh, into uh, a situation where they are not just the, uh, the receiver of the knowledge, but they become the creator of the knowledge. It also says that um, the activity should be designed in such a way that you shouldn't be investing much in terms of money. So try to utilize uh, all the free resources that are available around you. Um, and then you design it, you create knots, you, you involve the non-living uh, things also in creating the knowledge, uh, like social media platforms and various other things. So keeping that particular principle in mind, we designed this entire activity in which we uh, make students uh, teams, uh, wherein uh, each team had a few students from uh, Austria and few students from India. And uh, they were actually uh, asked to uh, pick up one ad advertisement um, from their own countries. And uh, they had to, so they were given two cautions in the beginning. They have to just search YouTube free resource material and they can pick up the one of the advertisements which somewhere directly or indirectly, explicitly or implicitly um, showing some kind of, you know, cultural thing which belongs to my country and their country. But it is, of course, in an anecdotal uh, mode. So uh, they used to pick it up and then they were asked to give two answers. So they have to discuss it in the team within the team and they used to answer so there were two questions that the faculty or the instructors used to give them and that is uh, how do you interpret this ad and what do you think how the the counterpart the team over there in the other country will interpret this particular ad and uh, then the ad advertisement was shared on email uh, they watched that uh, videos and they wrote a small write-up. So here my students wrote the write-up that this is how Indians are interpreting this ad. And then they used to send the ad over there. There the students used to watch and they used to give the answers. So it's like hardly 500, 600 words, but they have to put up their interpretation. Now this interpretation was exchanged. And then both the interpretation students were asked to work in team. They had certain, you know, uh, meetings on slacks and uh, they tried identifying the gaps uh, in the interpretation. So while they were doing this entire exercise, they were trying to figure out the gap in what they saw and what they understood in what actually the thing is trying to display. There were so many things that were taken care of, like very, very small uh, things which are related with Indian culture or which are related with the culture of the other country, which they found out as, you know, the gaps in understanding. So basically, it wasn't through the theory because we have been taking uh, Hofstede's theory and Trumpner's theory, the dimensions which they have given. But talking about their applicability, we were a little bit doubtful because these are very old theories and whatever they were telling in the theory, students were somehow not able to relate with it because things have changed. If you talk about India, they have given some six, uh, you know, basic dimensions. But if you talk about India, it's so difficult to apply that those theories within India because India is, uh, I mean, 23 uh, states and, you know, so many union territories and in every state you have a different culture. So it's a highly culturally diversified country where you cannot say that this particular dimension is this much in India and this much not in India because it might vary in different states. Uh, so there were many challenges. Uh, but then this activity actually worked a lot because initially it was difficult to make students interact. It was difficult uh, to make them open up and discuss and talk. But when they started discussing and when they started exploring, um, you know, the things that were there in ad, they found it very interesting. I'll just give you one example that uh, there is an ad in, in, uh, in India of Cadbury chocolate. And this ad uh, uh, is, you know, it is, uh, it is uh, sh uh, shown in a way 
that uh, there is a celebration going on. And there are so many, you know, festivals that Indians celebrate, uncountable, I mean, you cannot even count. So um, there is a festival called Rakhi. So the Rakhi is a festival where in India, uh, 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 sisters tie a band in the hand of brother. And the brother takes the pledge of, uh, uh, of you know, always protecting the sister, uh, no matter what. Uh, throughout the life. Now, this is uh, one of the things that is, uh, I mean, uh, something which is a part of our culture. It is celebrated every year. There is a national holiday and it's celebrated with full, you know, uh, participation and vibration. Now, when this ad went to the students over there and they watched it, they could identify that there is something happening with some people are uh, celebrating something. And in the interpretation, they wrote that Probably it's kind of, you know, friendship band which we tie to each other. And then the, when these answers came back to the Indian students, they started identifying the gaps in the interpretation. And when they started discussing on the video uh, conferences, uh, they were told that, yes, it's a kind of band, uh, but it's not a friendship band. It's a band in which the siblings are tying the knot and they're taking the pledge of being uh, in love with each other, protecting each other. And then they realized, oh my God, this is such a beautiful thing. We have never heard about siblings, uh, you know, taking pledge of uh, being in love and protecting each other. And uh, uh, so there were many, you know, small, small ads which were depicting these kind of small, small things which you never find in theories. And uh, when they started talking to each other and afterwards we took the feedback from the students that what did they learn, the first thing which almost everybody wrote was that we learned so many small, small things which we will never forget. I mean, there are so many things which instructors tell in the classroom regarding the theories, regarding, you know, the principles and blah, blah. But uh, when, uh, when it comes to retaining uh, those things and applying those things in the practical life, it is so difficult. And when we move to other countries, we find that whatever we have learned, um, uh, it was, you know, uh, something which was not found in the practical world. But these are some of the small, small things that we will never forget in our lives. And when we'll come to India, or maybe when my students will go over there, um, they'll keep this in mind. Okay, so this is what it is all about. So uh, this was the first act, uh, activity which I have talked about in my chapter. The second one, of course, many of you might be knowing is about the BBP project. So for last five, six years, uh, I have been the part of virtual business project, which is conducted by Marshall School of Business. And um, I've talked about how uh, we collaborate because uh, in India, uh, number of students in every class is very high. And uh, we have like 240 students for this particular program. I mean, everybody would like to go for this program. But then the kind of things that we at our level do, um, other than, you know, the, the design and the, 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 the entire project, which is run by majorly by uh, Marshall School of Business, uh, at the background, what are the things that we do and how we implement it? So how we run a mock, you know, the uh, mock uh, project, uh, before they get into this project, then uh, we take a session on report, business report writing with those students. And then we make it a competition based, like if not everybody can be the part of VBP project because there will be 240 students in VBP. I mean, more than, you know, half of the entire um, participating students uh, from the world. So we make it just 60 uh, and then they have to register first come first uh, served type of a thing. And uh, and then the, we uh, we of course uh, are always there for them. We uh, keep on you know helping them uh, at the backstage. Uh, they the most important uh, you know the challenges that my students face while doing the virtual business project is the time uh, gap management because most of the time uh, the meetings like today also the meeting is happening at night eleven o'clock. Uh, but for them, it is like night, um, three o'clock, four o'clock and how they're managing it and the conflicts that are happening and getting the time and all. So, and basically, after all, the project is over, we again have a meeting and we share the experiences with each other so that I can use those experiences in, um, in um, solving the problems uh, next year with the next batch. 
Yeah, so this is all about, you know, my chapter and uh, these are the things that I've discussed in my chapter. And I'm open for questions. Are you muted? I have to unmute myself here. So what criteria did you use to select the ads? Um, did you have any things like you cannot use this particular product or something like that? So basically, uh, we did not uh, restrict our students. Uh, there was minimum uh, faculty intervention. Uh, we were there just to support at the back stage. And they were the one who were taking all the decisions. The basic question that we posed, and before giving this exercise, we said that the ad should be implicitly portraying some element of your culture, country's culture somewhere. So it's not actually related with the product or something, but it has to be any product, but in the you know the the anecdote or the story around which it is being developed should have something related to indian culture so that when they see they start understanding oh so this is something that happens in india i think anna had a question i do yes. thank yes. you a lot stephanie yeah. Um, uh, well, I, I, I don't know if I'm going to dare to pronounce your name. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Forgive me if I mispronounce it. Uh, um, yeah. But uh, uh, thank you for your presentation. I have to admit that I didn't read it yet. Um, but I, I'm very interested in knowing um, more about your project. Um, and I was listening to you and I was wondering if it, is, if it doesn't have all the ingredients needed to have truly a collaborative online international learning project uh, formally thought as such, including the students evaluation assessment in this case. And uh, because you, you, you do um, think of uh, cultural aspects, so developing intercultural competence, you do consider um, uh, exchange among students that I, I assume it was online uh, um, because of the countries you mentioned. Yeah. Um, and I wonder if you thought of evaluating or assessing in this case, assessing um, soft skills, because more and more in, more in these kind of projects, we, I think it is important to focus on specific soft skills that we expect or transferable skills in some cases that yeah. we really expect students to develop. And one of the, well, uh, one of the discussions that we are having here now in Portugal is how to assess this right. kind of skills, how, right. to, how to develop them or contribute to their development. Well, we can manage. But how do we assess it? Right. And I don't know if you have thought of it. Uh, yes. So it was very much in place, uh, Anna. Uh, uh, we have designed it in such a way that after the interaction, uh, when the students evaluated these uh, ads, they were expected to write a small uh, write-up. And when these write-ups were exchanged and they were in the team, they were trying to find out the gap. Uh, they were expected to come up with a small business report. And this business report, in this entire business report, they talked about their experiences, what they learned from this entire activity, what were the gaps, and what were the takeaways. So these written documents were then assessed on the rubrics which have been designed in the department. Uh, these rubrics carry uh, you know, cross-cultural sensitivity parameters as well as soft skill parameters. So uh, this is the part of you know the assessment because it, it is also a part of AOL assurance of learning. So uh, we do have uh, you know the assessment procedure involved in this entire activity. Yes. Okay, that was great. And your chapter um, gave us a lot, not only of good information but a good springboard into um, the next chapters, which is why we started the section with yours. Um, it moves nicely into a newlies chapter on cross-cultural virtual teams and virtual engineering student teams. And so 
And really, you um, had some really great projects incorporating international experiences into internet engineering programs to battle the impact of COVID. What were some key takeaways you had from this approach? Thank you, Suzanne. And so the INVEST approach uh, creates uh, virtual international student teams between uh, University of uh, Toronto engineering students and students from different parts of the uh, country, uh, different parts of the world uh, in other institutions such as uh, Trinidad and Tobago, Nigeria, Germany, and uh, Brazil. And we got the students to work together on design and research projects um, within these target uh, communities. The student teams were usually uh, composed of four to five students, sometimes 10 students, and they worked on projects um, that were of um, four to eight durations. Um, now, the students were also supported with intercultural competency models on global team working, intercultural communication, conflict management, and decision making, as well as some project management concepts to help them enhance their virtual collaboration activities. We found that this approach was very helpful in helping the students who could no longer travel due to the COVID pandemic to enhance their global perspectives. Um, I would highlight that um, this, uh, the incorporation of global virtual team projects into engineering programs started before COVID uh, when my colleague, Professor Elham Mazi, who's here, set up INVEST. And the aim was really to provide students with alternative and accessible opportunities for international experiences. Of course, during COVID, this was really very helpful for the students who could no longer travel. Um, by introducing or by combining global virtual team projects with intercultural competency models, we found that it was a successful approach to help students, um, to support students in their collaborative uh, projects and help them learn in inclusively amongst diverse team members from all over the world. The students learned, to le learned how to listen, respect, and appreciate the multiple perspectives of diverse peers. Um, this strategy was also very a great way to help students develop their global competencies and sensitivities as, and promote the internationalization of engineering programs. Um, as the students work together, so the approach was experiential in nature. It uh, provided opportunity for students to um, uh, work on their virtual projects, apply the learning concepts, reflect on them, and then um, go back and try again. Uh, this enabled them, they learned to engage in intercultural interactions with each other, share aspects of their community, and be able to appreciate the diverse, the, the local communities that their projects were situated in. Even though um, this approach was uh, very successful during the COVID scenario, I see it growing post-COVID as more institutions explore accessible, equitable, and more inclusive strategies for helping students um, gain these um, professional and transferable skills. Thank you. Are you happy to ask the question, Susan? Is that okay? Yes, I was just going to say, Izzy, I think you had a question. Go right ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. And really, that sounds like such an excellent project. And it's clear that a key goal of the INVEST programme is intercultural competence. Um, I'm just wondering, because many educators recognise the value of equipping graduate students with 21st century global competencies, what do you consider as the main challenges with teaching these competencies in a non-travel abroad setting? And what were the main findings from your experience? Thank you, Izzy. What a great question. Um, so for me, what I see as a key challenge with teaching these global competencies in a non-travel abroad setting is being able to create an experiential learning environment where students can engage in these intercultural interactions and reflect on them and act on the learning concepts um, to improve their experiences. And this is typically why um, traditional approaches have been via study abroad programs or exchanges to allow students to immerse in the local cultures and experience these intercultural situations um, in a local setting. Um, so we try to replicate that in INVEST by creating these virtual projects and providing these global uh, projects that are have a local contest or a global contest depends on 
which perspective you're looking at it from, right? And so the students are able to uh, interact directly with um, people that they typically will not uh, encounter in their day-to-day -day environments. Um, they were, they're able to learn more about the cultures of those communities as they work together in projects. Um, they can, uh, the concepts, intercultural competency models provided them with concepts that they can then apply or practice in their projects with their diversity members, um, reflect on their experiences and improve on their uh, experiences as well. Uh, so it gives an opportunity to have that trial and error method that they would have typically had access to, sorry, in, I had to <laughs> put off the phone. sorry about that, <laughs> that they typically will have access to if they had traveled abroad, right? And, and, and that is one of the beauty of the virtual, uh, inverse virtual project experience. Um, our studies found that um, this approach was highly successful as students um, were able to recognize the similarities of their cultures and the cultural values of their peers, diverse peers. Um, they were able to appreciate and accommodate the worldviews and contributions of their team members, um, as well as be able to appreciate the cultures of the target communities. And this was um, evident in the decision-making process. So for instance, um, in one of the projects, they were trying to develop uh, a, a pump for one of the local communities. And their initial idea was to build an electric pump, right? Um, that's the de facto solution. However, as they engage the communities, they realize that one, the, the communities didn't have constant supply of electricity. So they had to look for alternative op op options and thought of gas. Uh, they also then realized that the communities were a bit apprehensive about gas. And so that led them to really challenge their, their creativity in developing a solution that was less um, gas heavy and didn't need electricity. Uh, however, the final solution had a, com a combination of a little gas, but mostly reliant on some manual uh, concepts. And that was well received by the community. So they recognized that um, they had to address the needs of the community and find a solution that was um, acceptable and added value to the community's way of living. Um, of, of course, the, the, they also provided feedback that the intercultural competency model helped them to um, learn how to be more inclusive in their teams. They engage in um, social interactions to learn more about each other, which helped them to foster a sense of community and build swift trust. Uh, trust is always very important when you're working in a team, and, and this helped them, um, this fostered a smooth collaboration for the team. Thank you. Thank you, Nelly. That's a really great point about experiential learning and virtual learning and leads nicely to Emil's chapter, which also had a lot of good things about experiential learning. Emil, what do you find is the most exciting thing about this experiential learning? So uh, for me being since 2017, as I mentioned, uh, basically in these global virtual teams uh, that I had um, se uh, such a diversified and wide portfolio of students <clears throat> uh, from uh, five, six uh, different countries and also bachelor's and master's students. So the most exciting was this uh, to overcome uh, the uh, intercultural barriers uh, to overcome the perception gaps in the global virtual uh, collaboration because I could have seen uh, really the, the gaps, the differences, how the students from each of those countries, starting uh, from here, from Central Eastern Europe, going to the Western Europe and then Northern America, uh, and to see how the students are perceiving uh, the challenges, how uh, they're communicating, and of course, all these, uh, I would say, even the, uh, in some cases, the student aversion, which was uh, to a certain degree expressed among some of the students. So to help uh, each of those virtual teams to overcome that challenges in uh, these global virtual collaboration. So uh, the cross-cultural differences, the, the perception gap differences, and the student aversion. Those three, if I can 
uh, kind of summarize these three aspects uh, was the most exciting thing for me because I really uh, enjoy challenges and uh, that's why I uh, took up with this project yeah back in time so. Is it you had a question? Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, thank you, Emil. So I'm really curious from my own experience, uh, you know, how do you tackle students who have a real aversion to virtual collaboration pro projects? What What is your way of overcoming that? <laughs> okay. Uh, in some cases, uh, first starting with my students, because uh, I, as I've been tutoring foreign students, uh, who uh, haven't been mine, you know, uh, not my, uh, initially my groups, they were foreign uh, professors group, but I was, uh, you know, supervising uh, their courses uh, in this virtual. So uh, starting from my teams, uh, from my students, uh, some of my students uh, due to uh, particular um, language barriers, uh, due to uh, lack of experience, uh, due to uh, basically the stage fair, especially uh, in a virtual collaboration that you need to speak to someone who you haven't seen be before. Uh, then the time zones difference because uh, when my students were basically facing the US students, uh, there was in the beginning, the first three weeks, uh, quite big challenges. And uh, all these factors taken uh, into consideration, plus of course the uh, national level, cultural national level factors because uh, particular students we can see uh, who is more extroverted, who is open-minded, who is kind of more open. But uh, of course, uh, not really by generalizing, saying that uh, these three, four factors, they were very challenging for me. So what I did is that uh, I uh, start uh, uh, getting in, into each team of my students and uh, trying to really understand uh, their issues, problems in uh, this particular project. And then I start working individually with each of them. They, they are master students. So they suppose, of course, to have the fundamentals, but as I said, uh, in some students, lack of experience, exposure, um, uh, very little communication, previous communication with uh, foreign students, and they, they weren't confident. And also they had some stereotypes, prejudice that uh, virtual collaboration is not, uh, doesn't lead into anything contributive or anything as added value. So I had to work with each of them individually. And in uh, the initial meetings, I was uh, basically uh, um, uh, being uh, present, uh, presented on the uh, web conferences, on the video calls. So I was there acting, of course, as a, a tutor, but at the same time, I was, you know, psychologically supporting my students. So to make sure that they're getting into the process and with the time, I can say that, of course, a majority of them overcome this kind of uh, uh, barrier because, uh, as I said, not all of them had this uh, previous experience. But however, COVID helped me, COVID time helped me because uh, we accelerated that uh, project in the last two, two years exactly due to COVID. So in that sense, COVID helped me to uh, have more often sessions, online sessions, and this virtual collaboration really was intensified. So that's why um, the students were more involved in the hands-on uh, real projects. Then they had the chance uh, to meet some managers from the companies because they were preparing for those companies' business strategies and they were doing even past the analysis, which is a strategic analysis, very important for the companies. And uh, they uh, kind of overcome this uh, stage fair, if I can say, because uh, the, 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 the experts, you know, the specialists in front of them, they were managers, they were professors, and my students with the time gained this uh, kind of confidence at least, which helped them to better now identify what is a global virtual. But the individual approach, it, it was a must for me because uh, it, otherwise if I group, uh, work just as a group, as an entire group, it will, be, uh, it will take me much more time and actually the effect in the end wouldn't be probably so, so high, yeah. Thank you, Emil. That's very interesting. Very helpful. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. I think all of us um, have had students who were terrified of the virtual group projects. And um, one of the things that I have to mention before I lead into Sandra and Anna's chapter is how my students in America come away very humbled, realizing they speak only one language and they're working with students who speak far more than one 
And that's good for my students to, to see. That's a very good foot in the door. That leads us really- ask no a question uh, before you sure. move on, Sandra? Sure. I'd be interested to hear from Emil. Um, did you have any sense that uh, the prejudices and uh, those barriers of these preconceptions that your students had before they entered the global project, did you have the sense that uh, the project helped to, uh, to decrease them or even perhaps that you found that um, there was even more a dislike of working with uh, other cultures. So I would, I would be just interested to hear what uh, impact that they had. Yes, a very good question. Thank you. Uh, I have to say that uh, because I'm teaching diversity management here uh, at our university for more than now four or five years. Um, so my st students before entering, starting the project by just hearing the project that they will be working with US students, uh, with German students, with UK students. Of course, they had, uh, I, I'm saying, of course, they had these kind of um, um, uh, cautious bias and unconscious bias, which exists, of course, in the, among, you know, like our nature. And I can see, I could have seen in the beginning how they said, oh, we will communicate with US students. So automatically they said the US students will have automatically much more expertise like okay the language knowledge and in general the exposure without even thinking that actually their u.s counterparts they weren't let's say bigger expertise in the area where they are yes with the language is true but that was the only one factor which was important for uh, conducting that so uh, these uh, stereotypes that were in the beginning out there Believe me, after a semester, uh, four months deliberation, after delivering the final presentation, the final findings, uh, conducting uh, five or six web conferences uh, with the US and so on, at the end, I could have seen uh, that uh, this kind of friendship between them, among them, was established, regardless uh, the, regardless the self-confidence of the US students or my students, the background of the professional background, the education background, and they found that actually um, it's not so scary to be in a, a international cooperation. Of course, the beginning was the scare of the unknown, you know, that, that what we expect. But it was true that in the beginning, these stereotypes, it's interesting to see how you know, from our region here, Central Eastern Europe, are looking towards the West. You understand what I mean? That automatically they said, oh, what we will be doing, because that will be super good, but we'll be really struggling with our knowledge. I said, don't worry about knowledge. Believe me, uh, it's a matching because we had selected very carefully profiles of the students before we uh, have launched that eventual collaboration. But it was very good question because exactly they kind of opened their eyes and many of the students were of course thankful at the end that they were part of this project. Some of them probably they were uh, maybe because they were that active, maybe they could have think that uh, it could have been much better. But even the negative experience brings us, you know, the bigger exposure in the life. And then when they start up the work, some of them are working. They know very well that this is the challenge of the new normal. This is the challenge of the COVID era. So uh, this is the thing. Yeah. So this is the answer. Yeah. That was a great question and a great answer because you're right. It is the it is the era of collegial working. It is the era of international working. Um, Sandra and Anna, your chapter addresses the effects of COVID, how it boosted the use of technology in teaching language and learning. Now that we're coming back into the classroom, do you think these same ideas and activities will still be relevant, or will we slip back into our own ways? So, um, so our chapter, the title was uh, Stepping Up to the Challenge. I have it open here. So uh, Innovative Online Strategies in the ESB, so English for Specific Purposes, digital, a Digitalized Classroom. Um, and basically what it was, it was a bit of a contribution to other ESB, to other English teachers. Um, in a way, we decided to, um, to share what we consider to be best practices in digital and virtual uh, learning. And rather than just 
listing a set of activities and a set of tools, we actually sat down and we kind of added a few extra layers. Uh, we put forward a matrix cross-cutting the four language skills, so um, listening, reading, writing, and speaking with the actual activities. And then we described our students' profile. We thought about different strategies. And our main goal was to, to reflect on what strategy could be used with which students and to different uh, ends. So be it a specific set of skills, a certain topic. So to kind of a bit of a guide um, so that we could always uh, also provide some practical examples that were basically mostly focused on collaboration, uh, the articulation between different courses, um, and of course the use uh, of technology. We, we reflect and describe strategies using quizzes, uh, writing activities, simulation, role plays, um, class discussions, all in virtual settings. And in a way, going back to your, to your question, I mean, I don't think there, I must say in our case, there's no going back. Um, I must say that we were already using some of these strategies on site in seated classes. Um, I would say even all of the strategies, basically, we use them in our classes pre-COVID. Uh, of course, we had to adapt uh, a bit. Um, instead of on-site uh, on quizzes, we had online quizzes using classroom response systems. But the strategy and some of the ideas were there. Um, of course, we just had to adjust um, and rethink some of the work uh, we've done. And I mean, it's very practical. We had several examples here of different projects, uh, which this uh, all virtual kind of wave made it, they made these projects even more important because people realized they had to work collaborative, uh, collaboratively. They had to go online because it was the only option at that time. So that, I don't think there was, we can't really go back. Something has changed for sure. Even students have become a bit more demanding in what uh, their expectations were on towards online learning and the, the use of technology um, is. And of course, there are alternatives that we can use in our, now we're back on site, right? So the, there are alternatives that we can still use. I mean, during, we described that in the chapter, we use lots of recordings and um, student produ produced uh, content. They produced pitches and different videos and recorded audio files. So this is for language classes. And this is something we can still use in our on-site classes. Instead of being in the classroom, actually give them time, let them be creative um, and then share whatever they made, whatever they, they produce. So there's no going back. I mean, not completely, <laughs> I don't think. That's great. Bellum, I think you have a question. Yes. Yes, if I may. Uh, so Sandra, thanks a lot for sharing this experience. Uh, you mentioned two things. One in your uh, introduction, you really emphasized the technology, the technology and the importance it, it has for you and for your classes. And in your presentation here, you mentioned uh, course collaboration. And we all are aware of the advantages of working of this diversity and multidisciplinarity uh, in teams. But I wanted to, to ask you, what do you consider to be the biggest challenges in interdisciplinary collaboration and what is the role of technology? How can technology help in this type of collaboration? Well, I would say, I don't know, the biggest challenge is probably finding a common ground. I mean, to find, well, the, these key issues which you can actually tackle um, or address together and having time, enough time to prepare things and to really think things tr through. Um, it can be very challenging. I mean, it's for technology. Now, if you think about the COIL project, we had several examples. Um, technology makes it a lot easier to communicate. Some of these international projects could not, could not have happened without all these new uh, or not so new uh, <laughs> uh, tools and applications we now have. Um, I think it can also help to, to boost creativity uh, in terms of uh, what we can do, what we can produce. So it adds a lot of, of range. So I think it's, I would say much easier to communicate. There's more project management tools you can also uh, use, that's, that's important. And this is something we can also, the digital competences, digital skills is actually something that all the different courses share. So it can also be 
a bit of this common ground to work on or to work from as a platform, maybe. May I ask? I know, I know, yeah. <laughs> Go ahead. Okay, just just in one sentence what we both also think because we work in interdisciplinary projects a lot mm -hmm. what we really do think is the main challenge is to find common grounds to identify transferable skills so that students can actually understand the relevance of studying both uh, subjects at the same time for instance so that they can see why english for specific purposes can really have an impact in their future or why i don't know management a management course can have can really have an impact in their future so i think one of the main challenges is for for teachers to find common grounds as to the transferables how how skills can be transferred between both courses and how they can interact in a way that students it, that it makes sense to students and in their future sorry <laughs> I think really um, that's the challenge, even with the master's level students often, they don't see that we aren't, we don't see that we are teaching the, these skills for a reason. It's, you know, it's sometimes I think that they think we are just sitting there saying, oh, I want to talk about this rather than, you know, you need this, um, and that experience. And I've heard that same thread through all of these comments, which has really been interesting. I think it's been great. Um, this has been a really great session. Wait, I've learned a lot. Shana has a question. Yeah. Oh, sorry, I, I can't. Okay, that's okay, that's okay. Uh, so I had a question uh, for Sandra. Um, I just wanted to know while uh, you were talking about the activities um, uh, that you designed for collaborative learning, uh, the four basic skills you were talking about, uh, LSRW. I just wanted to know if you could share at least one activity that was done for uh, enhancing the listening skills. I'm very curious about that because it's a difficult skill. Hmm, that's a hard one. I mean, um, there um, there is no specific activity for just one skill. We try to have to have more. Yeah. We had a lot of, of, um, of debates uh, going on, which of course also involved speed listening. Talks. And speed talks. Yeah. Speed, and speed talks. talks. Speed talks, mm -hmm. which we kind of divided the students into different breakout rooms and they mm -hmm. actually had to discuss different topics and interact. So it's speaking, but it's also uh, listening in a way. Yeah. Um, in one of the activities, we actually have them record their own dialogues that we then used in other classes with other students. So okay. to test a bit of their listening comprehension using their own materials. Okay. So this gives them a, a, a great language awareness because they realize, okay. oh, maybe I'm not saying this right or uh, so it's a different, it's a different way. But yes, we try to encompass several skills in, in, in different activities. It's not mm -hmm. just one, but to have this kind of extra layers again of activities. Okay. okay. Thank you. All right. I'm, for some reason, I'm only allowed to see three people in my Zoom. So I'm sorry about that, Arshna. Anybody else have questions? If not, as I was saying, this has really been a great session. I've learned a lot. Um, I want to do projects with everybody. I mean, I'm excited about all of this. And, you know, wouldn't that be fun? Okay. Um, but it's a great introduction to our book. And Stephanie, I think you have something you want to uh, tell us about it for the people, about our book for the people who joined us today. That's right. I am um, trying to share my screen here. I don't know if you can see it. I have an early Nikolaus present for everyone that's attended the webinar. Uh, I don't know if you're familiar with Nikolaus. That's a uh, tradition in Germany that on the 6th of December, children put their shoes out in front of the door and Nikolaus comes and puts uh, you know, um, sweets and, and fruits and little presents and stuff in there. So we have a little present for you guys. Um, by taking part in the webinar, um, you can acquire the book with a 50% discount. And here's the, on the slide, you can, you can use the QR code. And so um, if, if it doesn't work, uh, you know, 
this way, then please just reach out and, uh, and we'll be more than glad to help you um, get that discount. And uh, they also, of course, the company, the IGI would be interested in selling some more of its books. So here are some examples of some of the books that are available that might interest you. Also, um, I guess, at a discount. Anyway, um, I would like to also point to the webinar that's coming up next week. Um, that's the third section of our book, uh, focusing on virtual learning environments and employability. Uh, Izzy uh, is going to lead that webinar and we're gonna hear some uh, of the contributions of the other authors. And it would be really great if you would also join us for that webinar and bring in your insights. And um, I'll be also sharing that link uh, with all of you and posting it in social media. And also please feel free to pass it on to other colleagues and instructors who were not able to join us today. So that's basically it from uh, in terms of the goodies and um, a preview of what's to come next week. Any further questions, comments? I think some of the goodies were also the nuggets of wisdom that we learned during this session. Uh, it was really great. Yeah, we're, this session was recorded and uh, we'll make it available to everyone. You can access it and also welcome, of course, to pass it on. And, uh, and you'll be able to also see it on the IGI website. Yes. So with that, thank you, everyone. Thank you for spending this time with us. Um, it was a great hour. And uh, as uh, Stephanie said, we'll see you next week with our next uh our webinar. Okay. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye. suitable for use in your course syllabus and as an integral resource for research advancements within your department, this publication should be included within your institution's library along with these related publications. Offered in print, ebook, and print plus ebook, and as a part of IJ Global's ebook collection, this publication is available through IJ Global's online bookstore as well as many other major booksellers and platforms, including EBSCOhost, Gobi, ProQuest, and Oasis. Purchase or recommend this title to your library today.